Well, thank you very much. What I'd like to talk about is uh, how we think about systems biology and from uh, many of your points of view, what systems biology do that does that's really important is creates data, as you'll see, that's really essential to uh, deciphering biological complexity, and especially it gives us the tools uh, for dealing with biological noise. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is the focus we've had for the last five or six years on uh, systems approach to disease, and this has led to the emergence of what I think is going to be a real revolution in medicine, and I call it P4, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory, and we'll talk more about that uh, later in the lecture. If I had to epitomize the essence of this P4 medicine in 10 years, it would be the fact that each of you will be surrounded by a virtual cloud of billions of data points and will have the wherewithal to computationally reduce that uh, enormous data dimensionality to simple hypotheses about health and disease. And as you can see, the data is, is multi-scale and enormously uh, heterogeneous. It ranges from molecular and cellular data uh, all the way up to conventional uh, medical records and even up to social networks that will be important for assessing environmental contributions uh, to disease. So one of the grand challenges in systems medicine is how we integrate these different types of data together to ultimately formulate these, these predictive and, and actionable models. Uh, an issue that should be obvious to all of you is any ba big data set has enormous amounts of noise, and it's the systems approach to disease that give us the tools for beginning to, to uh, filter out the noise and see what the signal actually is all about. Now, you can ask why we need so much data to really be able to deal with disease in the patient, uh, and the simple answer is it is because Darwinian evolution has created enormously complicated organisms. It is a random and chaotic process, and it only builds solutions that work in the context of what selection in a particular environment requires. And it has, over the years, built complicated circuits on top of complicated circuits. So deconvoluting this complexity is an enormous job. And an essential principle that comes from this is the idea that you can only decipher biological complexity from the bottom up. You need to start with the data as a reality test of what really is. The complexity of biology reminds me of a Rube Goldberg cartoon. In this particular cartoon, Rube has strung together 14 different instruments that allow him to cool his soup. And in fact, if we were to analyze that device, that, in a sense, biological circuit, we'd see that it would enumerate the basic principles of systems biology. So to understand how that device worked, one, you'd need to be able to identify all the components in the device. Two, you'd need to be able to establish how they're connected one to another. And three, you'd have to be able to assess the dynamics of the device uh, in the context of understanding how it executes its function. And those are exactly the parameters that we need for uh, systems approaches to biology and, and systems approaches to disease. When I started my career at Caltech in uh, the early 1970s, uh, I read a book on the structure of scientific revolutions by Thomas Kuhn that really was transformational for me. It talked about paradigm changes. It talked about how difficult paradigm changes were. And it talked about how once established, the paradigm changes really transformed the science uh, in which they occurred. And this, uh, in retrospect, turned out to be interesting because I had the good fortune over the 40-some years in my career to participate in a series of five paradigm changes. And the first four inexorably led to the fifth one, which really is this 
systems medicine or P4 medicine. So the first uh, paradigm change that I did largely at Caltech was to develop five instruments that were uh, that gave us the ability to sequence and synthesize both proteins and uh, DNA. And all of these instruments ended up being commercialized. In fact, I started uh, Applied Biosystems to commercialize the first four of these instruments. And what they led to really was high throughput biology. One of these machines, the DNA sequencer, got me invited to the first meeting ever held on the Human Genome Project, and that, of course, was the second paradigm change. What was interesting is it enabled, uh, in, it, it, it was a project that was enormously controversial at the time. I remember going to the first meeting in 1985 held on the project, and 12 of us that had been assembled to assess it uh, came to the two conclusions. One, it was uh, feasible, although difficult, and two, we were split uh, vehemently, uh, six to six, on whether it was a good idea. And in fact, at that time, the entire biological community was probably 90% opposed to it, as was the National Institutes of Health. And indeed, the arguments against it were, it was big science, big science was bad, and we'll return to that point later, uh, that, that most of the genome was junk, and you wouldn't want to sequence junk, and, and so forth. But indeed, we did start the project in 1990, and it was finished in 2003, uh, and it had some really striking effects that we'll uh, talk about later. Putting together the team that developed the automated sequencer made me realize that, that biology in the future was going to have to incorporate a cross-disciplinary framework where we had scientists of all persuasions uh, computer science and engineering and chemistry and physics and mathematics that all came together so we could really integrate the biology together with the technology development uh, and the development of uh, analytic tools, and I'll say more about that later. And this quite naturally that led to the idea of a systems biology institute, which I started uh, in 2000. I'd started thinking about systems biology back in the, the late 70s, but it was clear we didn't have the tools, nor did we have the parts list, that is the list of all genes and all proteins, that we needed to do systems biology. And applying these systems approaches to disease led to systems medicine and or P4 medicine, and its essence is really quantifying wellness and demystifying disease, and we'll talk in some, some detail about that. Now, from these paradigm changes, I learned three really interesting lessons. That scientists are really conservative, and they find it very, very difficult to accept paradigm changes. I could give, in 1986, all the arguments I could give today about why the Genome Project was a good thing, but people weren't ready to listen to it. What's really interesting is you map into your own framework what other people say. You don't necessarily hear what they've said. The second thing was that new ideas required new organizational structures. Almost all organizations have bureaucracies that have been honed by the past, and they can barely deal with the present, and they really can't change very effectively. And new organizations give new ideas the right to grow and mature uh, with freedom, and every one of those five paradigm changes has required completely new organizations to really get off the ground. And then I will say that these paradigm changes really have fundamentally uh, changed how we practice biology, and I think there's no better example than the Human Genome Project. So I've listed here 16 things, and I think each of them is really significant in how biology has been changed. I actually sat down and wrote out this list when Nicholas Wade wrote this really narrow provincial article in the New York Times about how the Genome Project had failed. And uh, it gave us the, comparts the complete parts list of genes and proteins that let us do systems biology. And it made all genes accessible. It democratized molecular biology in a way nothing else could do. It led to new technologies, not only for sequencing, many other things as well. And it brought 
uh, to biology for the first time, computer scientists and mathematicians, software engineers, because they had to decipher the complexities of the genome. And it instituted open data, which was, I think, a marvelous uh, invention, at least for biologists at that time. And it utterly demanded a validation of the quality of the data. And in fact, Phil Green in the Department of Molecular Biotechnology I had at the University of Washington wrote that standardized hardware. It transformed our view of evolution. It made, gave us access to the genomes of microbes and plants and animals. Uh, and it transformed many aspects of medicine. And I think one of the most interesting things it did is it taught us that there are no race-specific genes. That means, in a sense, we are all one race. And if there are fundamental differences among the races, they're environmental and not, in fact, uh, genetic. And of course, Battelle did a recent study that said that the genome had generated more than $800 billion worth of economic opportunities for investment of $3.5 billion. So that's a good uh, yield and product. And those are the kind of arguments I think we have to make uh, for science and technology. Now, systems medicine and NP4 medicine allow us to approach complexity in a variety of different ways. And I'm going to talk about each of these five things. The idea of biology as an information science, uh, the, the fact that it's created very powerful cross-disciplinary infrastructures, the experimental approach to, to uh, systems uh, disease that allows us to capture their dynamics. And then it's really driven the development of, of new technologies and uh, pioneered new analytic tools. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, each of those. So how is biology, how, are, how is medicine actually in information science? And I'll give you just some of the basic uh, algorithms by which I think, uh, think about this. If you ask the question, what are the types of biological information that operate in living organisms, there are really two. One is the digital information in the genome, and the second are the environmental signals that come from outside the genome. And those two come together in a living organism and fuse to create the phenotype, that is, its appearance. And one of the interesting questions is, what connects, then, the information with the phenotype and there are two types of dynamical biological structures that do so. One are the biological networks that capture, transmit, process, and pass information on to the second of the structures, which are both simple and complex molecular machines, and it's they that execute the biological functions. And I must say, the interconnection between these two types of, of uh, information handling structures uh, is relatively seamless. Now, what is also interesting is that, as we know, uh, biological information is multi-scale, and it is hierarchical. It extends from DNA to RNA to proteins to metabolites and protein interactions and modules and all of the networks, and finally up to cells and organs and individuals and populations and ecology. And in a sense, each of those represents a stage in the hierarchy of biological information. And if we're to really and truly understand a system, say, from a particular level, say the cell, and how cell replication occurs, what we in principle have to do is capture all of the antecedent levels of information all the way back to DNA and integrate them together in such a way that we enumerate the environmental signals that happen at each of those different levels. Because it's only when we understand the digital input and the environmental input that we truly understand systems. The other point that I would make is that the key to dealing with biological complexity is obviously generating enormous amounts of data. And what's really important to understand in biology is how do we convert, then, the data into knowledge. And one of the enormous challenges is the signal-to-noise uh, issue. And in biology, there are really two types of noise. 
And this is why if you are to contribute fundamentally to biology, you have to have deep domain expertise so you can use whatever skills you have. One type of noise is technical, and that arises in the measurements and how we handle the data. But a second type of noise, and it's a much more serious type, is biological noise. And that comes about as a consequence of if we measure an aspect of phenotype of the organism, often multiple biologies contribute to that phenotype. If we're only interested in one of those biologies, we have to be able to subtract away the other ones. And I'll show you an example of how we can do that in one of the systems we've studied a little bit later on. I will say in biology that we've got six approaches to dealing with noise and, and creating knowledge. One is doing global analyses, that is studying all the components of a given level of information. And we can do that for genomic information. We can't do it for any of the other downstream levels of information currently. A second is studying the dynamics of the system, and we need to be able to study both spatial and temporal uh, dynamics. A third is we have to be able to carry out these integrations, as we've already discussed. And a fourth is we can use subtractive analyses in very powerful ways to subtract away unwanted biologies, and I'll give you examples of that in a moment. Statistics are really important in converting data into metadata, reducing the noise dimension. And finally, ultimately, we want this predictive modeling of systems data that can be, it can be descriptive, it can be graphical, or it can be mathematical. And the level at which you can focus on it is a function of how much information you have, obviously. A systems view of disease makes the very simple assumption that one or more of your biological networks in the relevant organ have become disease perturbed, either genetically or environmentally, and that alters the envelope of information that network makes. And that altered envelope of information changing dynamically during the progression of the disease explains both the pathophysiology of the disease and it gives us new insights into diagnosis, uh, therapy, and prevention. But the picture I've shown you here is flat and, in a sense, one-dimensional, two-dimensional if you wish. But networks are multidimensional. There are genetic networks and molecular networks and cellular networks and organ networks all the way up into including uh, the integration of these networks into the operation of the human and then the social networks of the human. And the really interesting point is we have to be able to create the networks at all of these levels of information. We have to be able to integrate the networks together to know how they are uh, interfacing one another. And we have to be able to understand the dynamics of how these networks actually change. And those all represent enormous uh, challenges for technology uh, and for computation. And it should be obvious that networks are great for organizing and integrating and modeling data, and they do let us handle the uh, signal-to-noise uh, issues. But the multidimensionality of networks is one of the fundamental challenges of contemporary systems biology and, and systems medicine. So let's uh, then move and talk a little bit about the infrastructure of systems biology and, and what that means. What has been very important in the creation of the Institute back in the year 2000 was that we created a cross-disciplinary culture upon which systems biology can rest. And the simple idea is that biology should be the driver of a process which dictates the type of technologies that one should uh, develop. And they, in turn, with their data, specify the nature of the analytic tools we need. So the biology is the driver of both technology and the development of analytic tools. And of course, if you're successful in those different points of this uh, holy trinity, as I call them, then you can really revolutionize biology. But two things, I think, are demanded. One is you have to create this cross-disciplinary environment with the scientists that are listed there at the lower right. And they must, one, learn to speak the languages of one another, 
And that is not a simple thing to do. We've actually set up special courses at ISB to do this. And two, they have to be able to work together uh, effectively in teams, driven by objectives with milestones and the like. We'll talk more about that later, too. The other thing we've done at ISB is create data generation tools that are seamlessly integrated to the data analysis tools, and they in turn to the model organisms and human beings. And we, I think, have pretty well succeeded in democratizing the data generation and the data analysis tools so that any scientist at ISB can use these to carry out either big or small science. What, uh, what I do want to stress is that we're just a little bit more than uh, 10 years old now. We have 12 faculty, uh, 250 staff. When we got started in 2000, I would say the vast majority of molecular biologists and the like were skeptical about whether systems biology really was going to be anything more than fluff. And it was gratifying to see uh, two important metrics, one a general one, this National Academy uh, report in 2010, which talked about the new biology, which was systems biology, and how it was going to transform uh, the biology and medicine of the future. And they were very, very explicit about all the ways that it would be able to do that, very much akin to what uh, we described back uh, 10 years earlier. And the second, on a more personal note, was a an institute in um, Spain that developed a new metric for assessing the impact of papers and then integrating all of the papers for a given institute and assigning a single impact factor for that integration. And they looked at 2,200 institutes across the world in all fields of science. And in that first uh, four-year assessment, ISB came in first in the US and third in the world in the impact of its papers. And we had papers in biology, in medicine, in uh, technology, and in mathematics and, and computation. So it attests to the power of this cross-disciplinary framework. ISB is really about, about these five different things. Taking a systems approach to science, biology, and medicine. Uh, driving the development of new technologies via the biology imper biological imperatives, and likewise, pioneering new analytic tools. But we're really interested in transferring knowledge to society as well. So we have uh, seven full-time people that have absolutely transformed K through 12 science education in the Seattle School District uh, over a period of about uh, 12 years now. And I'd be glad to talk about that. But the other thing we've done is we've been very successful in transferring um, our knowledge into co startup companies. So directly from ISB in 10 years or so, we've spun out five companies, all of which have done very well. And then together with one of these companies, the Accelerator, we've helped spin out an additional 12 companies. So we've spun out 17 companies in a little bit more than uh, uh, 10 years, and uh, many of them are doing very well. And finally, we're really committed to strategic partnerships for taking on big problems in science and in medicine, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. So the holistic uh, systems experimental approach to science, a simple analogy just to get the essence of what systems approaches are all about is, uh, if you were an engineer, how would you determine how a radio converted electromagnetic waves into sound waves? So, the first thing you might do is take the radio apart and look at the individual components and assess what they individually did. And frankly, that's what biology has done for the last 40 years, looking at individual genes and proteins. And what the Genome Project did was to, for the first time, give us a complete parts list of genes and by inference proteins. But what you'd know immediately is if you knew everything about how those components work, you wouldn't have the faintest idea how that conversion of sound waves and of, of uh, electromagnetic waves into sound waves actually happened. Because to do that, you'd have to put the components together in their circuits and then study 
individually and collectively how the circuits carried out this conversion. And of course, it's exactly the same in human beings. We have circuits, biological networks, that process information and generate phenotypes that are either healthy or diseased, depending on uh, the particular combination of genetic and, uh, and environmental signals. So let me give you an idea of how we've approached a neurodegenerative disease in a mouse model system uh, by using infectious prion proteins injected into the brains of animals that start at time t equals zero, the onset of the neurodegenerative disease. Uh, typically, the disease lasts 22 weeks. So what we did was look then at the brain transcriptomes, that is at the RNA populations in the brain, quantitatively uh, over 10 time points during this uh, progression of the disease. And at each time point, we subtracted from the disease uh, transcriptome, the normal mouse transcriptome. So we ended up with genes that were differentially expressed in the disease organisms. And among those genes, you knew you had the genes that encoded neurodegeneration. But to our horror, we found out that more than a third of the mouse genes changed in this process. So there's horrible signal to noise here. And most of the noise is biological noise. So what we did was put together eight inbred strain, prion strain combinations of mice carefully designed so we could subtract away various aspects of the biology. And when we were finished with that process, we ended up with a core of about 300 genes. And what we did with those 300 differentially changing genes was to map them into the four major biological processes we knew occurred in neurodegeneration from serial histopathologic studies of the brain. And the names of these uh, processes don't really matter. The most specific, of course, was prion accumulation and, and replication and two types of neurodegeneration and then the activation of inflammatory responses. And when we did this mapping, uh, and this is the prion accumulation and replication network, you could see that uh, at beginning at about, and we didn't show it here, at about eight weeks, you see the very, very first changes. At 12 weeks, you can see the red indicate the changes. And at 20 weeks, you can see a fair number of changes. So we knew that during the disease, there was a dynamic change in the nature of the disease perturb networks that occurred. What was really striking is when we looked at the four major networks, exactly as we've listed here for the first, they were disease perturbed in a sequential order, starting with the most specific, prion accumulation, then glial activation, and then the two forms of neurodegeneration. And the reason this is important is if you want to understand initiation mechanisms, if you want to understand new approaches to diagnostics or therapy, it's the most proximal network that you should really focus on, and we have done that. So if you looked at what we learned then, two-thirds of those 300 genes mapped into the four major networks. The remaining 100 genes identified six networks no one ever knew were associated with the disease, and that's one of the examples of the power of a global analysis where we look at all genes, we were able, with all 10 networks, to show they were sequentially activated at different time points during the progression of the disease. And the dynamics of these 10 networks explain virtually every aspect of the pathophysiology of the disease. So a very powerful first-time approach to explaining the disease in enormous detail. What they also do was gave us real insights into a new approach to what I call our systems diagnostics. And that was uh, we were able to demonstrate from all organs that we've examined, there are proteins secreted into the blood. And a fraction of these proteins turn out to be synthesized specifically in that organ. And these are called organ-specific blood proteins. And we've identified 100 for the brain and 100 for the liver, both in human and mice. 
and say what the 100 brain-specific proteins do for a normal brain is their concentrations are set at one series of levels. And if you have a disease brain, then those organ-specific brain proteins whose cognate networks have become disease perturbed change their concentrations. And they do so for each disease in a unique way because different diseases perturb differing combinations of neurologic, uh, biological networks. And that means we can distinguish health from disease. And if disease, we can say what, uh, what the disease is. And indeed, we started uh, a, uh, a company called uh, Integrated Diagnostics about three years ago that uses this strategy. And it's been extremely successful uh, in the last three years. And in fact, we'll have products on the market uh, at the end of this year looking at uh, lung cancer. So it's turned out to be a very powerful approach. The other thing we did was to take 15 brain-specific proteins that mapped into evenly into the four major networks and showed that we could, from the blood, do two important things. One, diagnose this disease 10 weeks before there are any clinical signs in the animal of the disease. So that's pre-symptomatic diagnosis. And number two, we could actually determine the order and timing of the disease perturbation of each of those four networks. So from the blood, we can follow disease progression. And that means we can do early detection. We can do disease stratification. And this is really important in systems medicine because virtually all major diseases aren't one disease, but they're a series of distinct subtypes and we can use the blood-specific brain proteins to stratify different types of neurodegenerative disease because each, again, uh, alters differing combinations uh, in a disease-perturbed way of the, of the networks. So we can follow progression, and we haven't done it, but we can certainly follow therapy and assess reoccurrences. And we'll talk later about how we're going to use these uh, as wellness assays in the future. Uh, and again, integrated diagnostics has done just a fascinating job in this regard. What about the emerging technologies? I'm going to really just talk about three major ones. So one, the complete sequencing of human families. This integrates genetics and genomics, and it lets us find disease genes in very powerful ways. Number two, we've developed a series of techniques that have led to a proposal. I just finished last week a white paper on uh, a proposal for a human proteome project, which we're sending uh, to the national funding agencies. Not a good time to be doing it, but at least we'll get it on the list of big projects for the future. <laughs> and we'll talk about how we've done that. And then finally, we're developing really fascinating clinical assays for patients that let us explore new dimensions of patient data space. On the sequencing of family genomes, we've actually outsourced our sequencing to the company Complete Genomics. And Complete Genomics now has the best data quality of all of the companies that are out there, very, very well documented. What we started with was a family of four. The parents were normal. The two kids each had two different genetic diseases. And we were hoping we'd be able to find the disease genes more easily by complete family genome sequencing, but we found that we could do much more. Indeed, one, we could correct 70% of the sequencing errors in this family because of simple principles of Mendelian genetics, eliminating things that were errors. Number two, we could actually identify rare variants uh, and distinguish them, again, from sequencing errors by asking, do two or more members of the family have it? If so, it's a rare variant. And more and more rare variants are important in uh, being disease genes. We can determine the order of the genetic variants on each pair of chromosomes uh, in each of the individuals. This is called the haplotype. And for a variety of reasons, knowing haplotypes is really going to be important in the future. We were able, actually, to determine the intergenerational mutation rate of the two kids. And each of them had about 35 mutations that separated them uh, from their parents. And what's interesting about that is, if you think about it, there's no such thing as an identical twin. 
at the bare minimum, they'll have those mutations that will separate them one from another. And finally, we were able to find very nicely four disease gene candidates, and it was easy to make the two specific assignments to, to the two different disease genes. But what I'd like to talk about is the fact that your genome sequence is going to be a routine part of your medical record, and I'd argue it's going to be so in less than 10 years. And why is that? Well, first, the cost of a complete genome, I think, is going to come down to a few hundred dollars in the next five to eight years with third generation sequencing, which is nanopore single molecule electronic signal readouts. And that's going to, through parallelization and uh, optimization of the process, really bring the sequencing down to the point where I think we'll be able to do complete genomes in 15 minutes quite easily. Number two, what's going to drive this process are what we call actionable variants. And an actionable variant is a mutation which, if your physician knows you have it, can tell you something that will improve your health. And I'll give you an example of a Microsoft friend of mine who discovered at the age of 40 he was beginning to get osteoporotic. And he had a genetic analysis done of a number of his genes. And he discovered that one of his key vitamin D transporters had a, a disabling mutation. And he was able to compensate for this merely by taking 20x the normal amount of vitamin D, and he was back to normal in, in about a year and a half. So what we've been able to demonstrate is almost 300 actionable gene variants. And the number is increasing exponentially. And what this means is very interesting because once you have your genome done, you will have it searched every year for the new actionable variants so that you can optimize your health. So the investment in a genome sequence is going to be a lifelong investment in, in improving your health and so forth. And this will all be done in the context of family genome sequencing, both because we can minimize the sequencing errors and we can optimize finding disease genes if you have them and or uh, find wellness genes. And we're not going to talk about how you find wellness genes, but we're actively in the search for doing that. Here are some of the programs that in the last two years have come out of this family genome sequencing. And the details really aren't important about all these programs, but I will say two things. One, the programs were driven by needs of, uh, and domain expertise. And each of these things is enormously useful for analyzing various aspects of family genomes. And the real challenge is how we take these individual packages and put them together in a platform in an integrated manner that will let us do overall. And that's where interesting collaborations between some of the people here and some of the people at ISB uh, could come to the fore. Proteomics is really an interesting field. It's very, very different from DNA, proteins are, in many different dimensions. DNA is digital, proteins are analog. DNA has a complementarity that lets us amplify it easily so we can look at very, very rare copies. Uh, protein has no such uh, easy method of amplification. Proteins are incredibly complex because of all the ways you can modify the protein synthesizing machinery through mutation and gene fusion and RNA splicing and editing and processing. and modification and so forth. And we're guessing, it's only a guess, that humans have perhaps uh, 10 to the sixth, a million different proteins, and maybe the number is much greater. Proteins are dynamical. They change their structure. The change in structure is a part of carrying out their function. Uh, and proteins have a vast uh, dynamic range of expression. So in the blood, there are proteins that can uh, like albumin, be present at enormous concentrations as contrasted with other proteins that are there in uh, uh, 1 in 10 to the 10th fewer uh, copies and so forth. And it's mass spectrometry that currently we're using to be able to both identify and quantify proteins. And together with Rudy Abersall, the institute over the last few years has developed this field of 
targeted um, mass spectrometry. And it allows us basically to set up assays for individual human proteins. And we can analyze now on the appropriate mass spectrometer, a triple quadrupole mass spectrometer, anywhere between 100 and 200 proteins in an hour across the dynamic range of 10 to the fifth with uh, concentration levels at, at the uh, mid atomo level or so. So it's a, it's a very, very exciting uh, new approach. And in fact, more recently, we've integrated these together with the other things that we've done. Uh, two computational pipelines, the transproteomic pipeline that allows us to validate the, qua the quality of mass spectra, and then the protein atlas, which allows us to store those. And we have more than 4 million mass spectra stored there, and it is the standard atlas that's used by most people in the field now. And then these two other applications, uh, uh, the SRM, the targeted mass spectrometry, and more recently, uh, Rob, Rob Moritz at ISB has actually created assays for all 20,000 human proteins. And in fact, together with Rudy, we have essentially complete assays for proteins in yeast, in humans, and tuberculosis, and we're starting to do so in Drosophila and uh, in the mouse and so forth. And of course, what this has led to, again, is just as we spoke earlier about the genome, this is a democratization of proteins that makes virtually any human protein available to any biologist that has the right type of uh, instrumentation and so forth. Now, if we want to do blood assays on 340 million Americans twice a year, we aren't going to use mass spectrometry. Rather, we'll almost certainly use a microfluidic ELISA chip to analyze large numbers of proteins. And together with Jim Heath at Caltech, we're embarking on an endeavor where ultimately what we'd like to be able to do is identify 15 organs, 50 organ-specific proteins from each of your 50 major organs and then be able to quantify those 2,500 proteins in the blood on a routine basis because that would allow us to survey longitudinally over time the health of all of your different organ systems and see any gradual transition into disease. Now, what can we do today? Well, we, uh, Jim has developed uh, uh, a chip that has essentially 50 ELISA assays. It uses 300 nanoliters of plasma. Uh, it takes about five minutes to measure these 50 proteins. Again, mid atomo level sensitivity and a good dynamic range, and we're actually using it at UCLA to look at some really interesting responses of patients with cancer to both immunologic and chemotherapeutic uh, drugs. Um, one of the big issues that comes up is how easy is it to go from 50 to 2,500? And the answer is impossible with the current technologies. The ELISA assays now each use a pair of monoclonal antibodies, and I would guess on average those pairs have cost far in excess of a million dollars per pair and often years to generate. So together with Jim, we're working at new approaches to create protein capture agents, and I won't have time to talk about that. The clinical assays that we're using for exploring new dimensions of patient data space fall in all the major categories. So in genomics, we're now setting up to be able to look at these 300 actionable gene variants to look at disease genes and to look at actually genes whose variation affects how you metabolize drugs and can get you into trouble if you don't know about them. Uh, and many other assays I won't talk about. In proteomics, again, we have lots of assays, including the 2,500 uh, organ-specific blood proteins I just spoke about. But a new area that we're just beginning to work in is, uh, was the development of a new mass spectrometer uh, at AB SciX that allows us to think for the first time of carrying out global proteomics analyses. And the analogy is kind of like if you wanted to determine the structure of the Eiffel Tower, you'd go to Google Earth and you'd get the images that they have there and be able to look at just what the Eiffel Tower looked at. 
And exactly for this new swath, what it can do is in an hour, it can digitize the, all of the triptych peptides in a given proteome mixture, and then you can analyze them against a standard that has all triptych peptides that are at least necessary for quantitative analyses, and this will be hundreds of thousands of these things. And what it means is you can take the picture once, you have a permanent digital record. As you build up this uh, reference library, you can continually analyze in more detail this, this analysis. And it gives us the possibility for doing dynamical analyses in, for example, the mouse brain for prion, just as we did the dynamical analyses for the transcripts. And I think it's really, really going to be a revolutionary new proteomics procedure. Uh, single cell analysis is really going to be important in the future. And I'll give you an example of something we're working on now. And that is the ability to create a microfluidics chip that, one, can separate uh, blood from white cells and then separate the white cells into their 10 major types and then analyze at the single cell one or more of those 10 different types of white blood cells. And the idea is the white blood cells will be every bit as powerful to diagnostic reagents as the organ-specific proteins because they allow us to assess very effectively many different types of biology, inflammation, immune responses, uh, apoptosis, a whole variety of other things. And then finally, we're really interested in using stem cells, induced pluripotential cells that we can derive from each individual to analyze the nature of their disease and even to stratify it. And I'll show you how we do that in just a moment. To give you an idea of the power of single cell analyses, we, uh, about a year ago, looked at uh, 32 cells from a cell line, a human glioblastoma brain tumor cell line. And we were able to analyze 24 transcripts and use the transcripts that varied to map them into uh, n-dimensional space. And what we found is 30 of the 32 cells found, fell tightly into one of three clusters that were widely separated from one another. We have no idea what those populations represent, wh whether they represent transitions or rep whether they represent functionally discrete populations, we don't know. But the point is, in the past, we've done biology by squishing together all the different cells in an organ or a system we wanted to analyze, and we've lost an enormous amount of the signal and increase the noise, and single cell analysis will allow us to change that. And in fact, the other exciting thing that we, we've done with Jim Heath, of course, is develop single cell proteomics. So Jim now has a microfluidic device that can do up to 10,000 single cell analyses measuring 20 different proteins that are secreted from uh, innate and adaptive immune cells. And these kind of tools are really going to transform biology in the future. Now, the iPS cells are really interesting. So we now can create these induced pluripotential stem cells either from taking buccal smears, from taking fibroblasts from the skin, or taking white blood cells from the blood. And we've used the latter approach. And what's nice about this is once you have the induced pluripotential cell, you can expand it as indefinitely as you want to billions of cells, if you wish. And then there are protocols now for differentiating these, in the case of our collaborator cellular dynamics, uh, to four different cell types, neurons, cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, and uh, hepatocytes. And we're interested in looking at neurons. And we're going to use this approach to actually stratify a disease like Al Alzheimer's into um, its different uh, sub, uh, subgroup types of uh, disease. And the approach is to collect the families with Alzheimer's, then to create iPS cells from each member in the families, and then to differentiate those cells to neurons in a test tube, and then to use single cell analysis to separate the different populations of neurons by cell sorting, 
and then to probe those neurons with environmental signals, uh, their, their natural ligands or drugs or RNAi. And the idea is that each different subtype of Alzheimer's will perturb differing combinations, disease perturb differing combinations of networks. So each subtype will have a different readout to these environmental signals. And once we've stratified those, then we can go back and do family genome sequencing, maybe begin to identify the genes. But even more important, we can go to the drug companies with their 150 unsuccessful Alzheimer's drugs and say, you should test it against these discrete stratified populations. Uh, and uh, we haven't done this, but I think it's very, very likely to work. And then the final area, of course, is domain-driven transforming analytic tools. And I'll just show you a couple of examples. Ilya Stromolovich is a part of the Cancer Atlas project, and what he's developed are tools for integrating many, many different types of genomics data and actually stratifying diseases in really interesting ways. What uh, Nathan Price has done is for the first time been able to integrate together in a seamless manner gene regulatory networks with metabolic networks. And that is really important because it's key to redesigning microorganisms to generate chemicals according to your own needs, fuels or, or uh, fine chemicals or what have you. And here's just a partial list of things we've developed just in the last few years. Some are really major efforts and some are minor efforts, but they all need to go through this integration of platforms to make them usable in seamless ways. And it's unfortunate because NIH doesn't pay for anything but the original uh, development of the software programs. And I'll, I'll list some of the, the challenges I see, computational and mathematical. IT for healthcare is really a mess in this country, and I'm going to say more about that later. So uh, how do we identify actionable variants in whole human genomes? Suppose you get a mutation in a gene that we don't know anything about. How can we say whether that variation alters the gene to make it defective? So one of the things we're exploring is can we use in silico protein folding techniques to assess whether mutations are likely to cause major protein folding uh, alterations. How do we integrate genetics with the dynamical networks? This is the new emerging field called systems genetics. We make now global measurements of many of these different types of data. How do we do their quality assessment and how do we eventually put them together in their own networks? This enormous high dimensionality of data and signal to noise challenges, we've talked about uh, all of those uh, challenges. How do we convert the data into the corresponding networks? And can we do that more and more in silico? Or do we need to develop, as many are trying to do now, increasingly powerful microfluidic and hopefully nanotechnology based uh, approaches to doing this? Uh, integrating. Uh, and, and visualization of multi-scale information is a major problem. Uh, capturing high-throughput phenotypes, images, other kinds of phenotypic measurements, and then mapping them into genetic and environmental perturbations to create uh, systems genetics uh, integrated types of networks. And this network of networks I talked about, how do we seamlessly integrate those different levels of integration together? The other point is data space and biology is infinite, and more and more we're going to have to start thinking about good programs for simulation to choose which are going to be the most effective experiments to uh, reveal uh, the, the, uh, the secrets to network behavior and interaction and so forth, and the visualization of integrated data and models and so forth. So that's a partial list. You'll have these. You can look at them in more detail if you're interested. Now, I just want to say P4 medicine is essentially the application of the principles of systems medicine to human patients. And that's what I'm going to talk about from now on, this P4 medicine. And it arises due to the convergence of systems medicine and obviously the digital revolution. And we've talked about the five uh, pillars of systems medicine, 
how they allow us to deal with complexity and, and disease. Uh, and I won't summarize those any further. But the digital revolution is also giving P4 medicine some really important tools. One, tools that will let us analyze uh, these big data sets and manage them. Two, personal devices that more and more are uh, revealing, uh, allowing us to measure uh, the details of our own physiology and digitize them. And that's what we call a quantized self. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. And then finally, information from the, uh, the big data sets is driving the development of social and business networks. I mean, uh, uh, re Realty has been, uh, or, or uh, um, uh, Amazon has absolutely revolutionized the, the whole uh, uh, business of selling products and things like that. And I would argue social and business networks are going to do exactly the same uh, for medicine in ways that we'll talk about. So let's talk briefly about the four Ps. And I'll give you a 10-year horizon on these things. So predictive, in 10 years, you'll all have your genomes done. And from those, we'll have thousands of actionable variants. You'll be altering how you behave to optimize your future wellness. I'd say a second thing we'll be able to do is have a handheld device that'll prick your thumb and measure these 2,500 organ-specific proteins from 50 organs. And you'll have longitudinal information about health and follow very closely any transition from health into disease. On the prevention side of things, uh, for the first time, we can actually look at a disease perturbed network and we can begin to develop the logic whereby we can use multiple drugs to re-engineer that network to make it behave in a more normal fashion. And we're having terrific success in microbes beginning to learn the principles to do this kind of thing. But I argue this is going to be a completely new approach to the identification of drug targets. So drug companies make drugs very well. They're terrible at selecting drug targets. And that's exactly what systems biology can bring to the occasion. The, the other point I would make is systems approaches to understanding the immune response will let us optimize uh, cellular responses in vaccines. And for the first time, we can deal effectively with AIDS and malaria. Some of the other vaccines into which we poured billions of dollars and have absolutely gotten nowhere. But the big uh, change in prevention is going to be wellness. And that's going to be an enormous increasing focus of P4 medicine as we move into the future. We'll talk more about that. You all differ individually uh, by 6 million nucleotides on the average from your neighbor. And that means you're uniquely individual. And that mandates, A, that we treat you as an individual and not as a member of a population. And B, that you have to be the control for your own data to assess, to assess when there are transitions from health uh, into disease. Now, the participatory is, the, uh, is one of the most challenging of the four Ps. My prediction is that patient-driven social networks for disease and for wellness are going to be one of the major driving forces for medicine in the future. And in fact, as I look at the medical world today, doctors are notoriously conservative. Healthcare systems are incredibly conservative. Payers and providers don't really want to change anything. I think what's going to drive the P4 revolution and change are going to be uh, patient-driven social networks. Now, another point that's really important is it's utterly essential that society have access to all of the patient data so it can mine these data for the predictive medicine of the future. And that means we have to protect patients against uh, abuse by employers and, and uh, insurance companies. Uh, and it means that we have to completely change our IRB system, the way by which we deal with patient permissions and things like this. And I think this is an enormous imperative if the US is to be competitive in this new field of P4 medicine. I can tell you there are countries like China that have no such constraints. And they'll be able to aggregate data and mine it for the future. And I've actually talked to a number of patients and their families. And the argument that 
by making your data accessible after anonymization that you're going to improve medicine for your kids and your grandkids, I think is a compellingly powerful one. The question of how do you educate uh, patients, how do you educate physicians, how do you ed educate the healthcare community is an enormous, overwhelming challenge here. And I think it's one that has to be handled by uh, information technology in the future. And then there is the information technology for healthcare. And I'll say that of all the companies out there that are playing this game, and I include Oracle and Microsoft and, uh, and Google uh, and IBM to the extent I know what they're doing, I think they're all missing by orders of magnitude the nature and magnitude of the problem. And I think all the things they're doing, we're going to throw out within three to four years because it isn't going to be able to handle the new kinds of data we'll be generating. So how do we create an infrastructure which has sufficient cycles and uh, cloud storage? Uh, I think these things really ought to be open source. I'll say more about that in the future. And certainly extensible and interoperative and so forth. Uh, I think enterprise solutions are always dangerous. I think you drive, use domain expertise to drive smaller packages. You integrate things together and you make them exchangeable as uh, things uh, advance. I think we really need a gold standard of inter internet information for medical information. Patients now go to the internet and come in with uh, stories that are 70 or 80 or 90 percent wrong and it takes physicians an enormous amount of time to talk them out of uh, what they think they know about these things. So we do need a gold standard. We need to be able to handle conventional medical records and histories, and uh, there are a number of companies that are doing this successfully. How do you handle the molecular, cellular, and phenotype data that I've been talking about and the actionable gene variants that I've discussed? And how do we do the comparative and subtractive analysis of the billions of genomes and their attendant phenotypic data that will be necessary for mining for the predictive medicine of the future? How are we going to handle the digitalization of data from all these individual patients as more and more of these uh, digital devices become uh, widely used and extens handle the extensive imaging data that's going to come uh, in the future? or the social network data, or the longitudinal data gathered, as I've talked, on individual patients. And how are we going to finally put all of this together and begin defining this network of networks and finally decide, create the predictive and uh, actionable models that are actually uh, necessary? My thoughts about the development of these things, which uh, all companies hate, I think it should be open source. I should think it should be driven by domain expertise. Uh, I remember having an, an enormous argument with Bill Gates about two years ago when he was talking about IT for healthcare, and he argued it could be done without any biological medical domain expertise whatsoever. It was just another computing problem. And I think, I think he's actually changed his mind. But uh, uh, and how do we integrate these discrete software? packages into coherent platforms and make them uh, interchangeable and ad advanceable. And you know, there, there's a really important question we haven't discussed, and that is what is the granularity of information we need uh, to be able to solve particular problems? And I would argue for disease, the granularity of information we need is enormously greater or less, depending. I mean, we need less specification than we do for biology. Because for disease, often it's just recognizing patterns that we need to, uh, to be able to do. So the current medicine is evidence-based medicine. And the medicine I'm advocating is this uh, proactive P4 medicine. And they differ in every dimension. And I must say, physicians really hate this slide. But P4 medicine is proactive. It's wellness-driven. It's all about many measurements. It's all about being individual-centric. It's about integrating data and things like that. It's about social networks of patients and capturing that information, being driven by that. And equally important, it's about the stratification of disease into the subgroups. For example, Genentech um, recently was able to stratify breast cancer 
into a number of different groups and developed a drug that covered uh, about a quarter of the patients in the breast cancer uh, uh, menagerie. And they were able to go into the FDA with 40 patients where they had a 95% cure rate and they got approval of the drug. So the FDA's job's made hard because most of the drugs that are brought to the FDA are terrible drugs. And if we can stratify patients, we can really change that. The patient-driven networks, I, I again really want to emphasize. And to give you an example, here is a, an example of Larry Smarr's qualified, uh, quantified self. So Larry, many of, I suspect you know him. Uh, Larry started gathering digital data from 60 parameters uh, over 10 years ago. And about six years ago, he started looking at C-reactive protein, which is an in indicator of inflammatory uh, res uh, response in the body. And he noted when he started that his C-reactive protein was a factor of 10 above normal. And over a period of the next two years or so, he went to five physicians who all totally blew him off and said, don't worry about it, you're fine. Well, it turned out he has inflammatory bowel disease. He had an acute episode, his bowel ruptured. He was in the hospital, he almost died. And here's a patient who is really gonna drive the change in medicine, and he isn't gonna to listen to physicians who tell him not to worry about the parameters that he's measured. And I'll make the prediction that more and more of us will be doing this in the future as it becomes easier to do. So the central themes of P4 medicine are quantifying wellness and demystifying disease. And one of the questions I've been intrigued with is how do we bring uh, P4 medicine to patients? What are the real challenges? And I think there are two. One are the technical challenges, which we've talked about. And the three, are, uh, the second is the societal challenges, which we largely haven't talked about, but they deal with the healthcare system, the regulatory system, patients themselves, and so forth. And I would argue that the second challenge is far the greater than the first. And the approach that ISB has taken in bringing P4 medicine to patients is one to take a really big science approach to solving the problems of P4 medicine, and you've seen it throughout my lecture, re requiring this cross-disciplinary integrated systems approach. But two, we've really been interested in bringing in uh, strategic partners that have enabled this process. And I'll talk about two of those partners because they both were very interesting. We developed a partnership about two and a half, three years ago with the state of Luxembourg. We agreed to do two big things for them and they in turn agreed to do, to give us 100 million over five years to develop the P4 tools and strategies for patient assays. And that's made possible much of what I've talked about here. And the second approach that we've taken is we created the P4 Medicine Institute, which is a nonprofit that is committed together with ISB, ISB to create a small network of five to six clinical centers that will join together and create a series of pilot projects as proof of principle in P4 medicine. And in fact, this P4 Medicine Institute has been enormously successful. So as you'll see in a moment, we've succeeded in recruiting two partners and have three or four that are very close to a, a green. And um, we're also uh, beginning to look at pilot projects. And one of the most interesting pilot projects we're doing with both medical centers are wellness projects. And I can talk more about that in the discussion. We, uh, the institute is, uh, P4 Medicine Institute is creating the vision to the broader healthcare community. And it's actually identifying consultants who can take on a lot of the societal opportunities and challenges. And we're writing a series of white papers on, on these things. So our founding member is Ohio State Medical School and more recently Peace Health has joined us. And as I said, we've got four to six others later. And my real dream is after we've had this network operating and we've got the pilot projects working and demonstrating the power of P4 medicine is that we can, can 
convince a small nation, and I'm actually talking with four different small nations now, to actually take on P4 medicine as its fundamental health care strategy uh, for the next uh, period of five years or so. And we'll see if that's going to be possible. I think it would be very difficult to approach the U.S. Uh, globally because of the heterogeneity of the healthcare system uh, and the general uh, cynical skepticism of many different members of that, uh, that community. So if you ask me what P4 medicine, what systems medicine is really going to do for us in medicine, I would say powerful new mechanisms for understanding disease. Uh, the family genome sequencing is going to let us uh, identify disease genes, and it will allow us to use actionable genes to improve health. We're going to make blood into a window that will let us do disease diagnostics and assay drug toxicity. We didn't talk about that. And assay wellness as well. We're stratifying diseases into their distinct subtypes for an impedance match against appropriate drugs. We now are beginning to look at the organ-organ networks by looking at uh, multiple organ-specific blood protein sets uh, to see just exactly how that complexity arises. And we're pioneering these new clinical assays and computational tools. And we're enabling this new approach to identify drug targets by re-engineering uh, disease perturbed networks and so forth. And finally, we're really going to push optimizing uh, individual wellness. I think P4 has four really striking social implications, societal implications. One is going to force every member of the healthcare community to revise their business plan in the next 10 years. And I think a lot of them aren't going to be able to do that very effectively. And it will create enormous opportunity for the creation of companies that are adapted to the new P4 demands. I think it'll turn around sharply the escalating costs of health care, and I think reduce them to the point we can uh, export health care to the developing world. And in that regard, who would have thought in 1990 that a woman in a rural village in India with a cell phone could make a living for her family? That, I think, is what the digitization of health care of, of, um, uh, of disease is actually going to do for uh, individual patients in developed and undeveloped countries. And of course, the quantization of the self is really going to let us optimize wellness in fascinating new ways. And I think P4 medicine is really going to create significant wealth for the early adopters. For example, my prediction is within 10 to 15 years, there will emerge a wellness industry that will far exceed the healthcare industry, and it will be created by players that are entirely different from those in the healthcare industry. So, final comments. One, um, this really makes you think about how you need to educate biologists. And I would extend a lot of the things I'm going to say about education to uh, any discipline of science or engineering. I think we should do conceptual teaching rather than uh, detailed teaching. The professor giving you lectures about his favorite topic in enormous detail. Uh, we ought to take a systems of view of the components of biology. You need, biologists will need really good training in physics and chemistry, mathematics and statistics. And I think all biologists should be dual cross-disciplinary majors, where biology and, and an orthogonal science should be those, those majors. Learning to think analytically, we all agree that's really important. But learning to think outside the box is something we don't do. I think people, scientists are so terribly conservative. And in fact, the way we teach them encourages them not to think outside the box. Many courses to get breadth and learn other languages of science. And I think new approaches to teaching computational tools would be terrific. And I think we really have to deal with these societal implications for science, the anti-intellectualism and anti-science. And I think we should recruit our students to help us deal with those things. New ideas need new organizational structures. I made that point earlier. And if you go through the five paradigm changes that I was in, participated in, you can see the fundamental new structures that enabled those. But I think the interesting thing for an uh, organization like Purdue 
is in the context of a given bureaucratic organization, can you create organizational structures that will let you adopt really new things? And I think the answer is you can, but it's really difficult. Uh, I think this idea of strategic partnerships that are international, that allow you to take on and attack the problems of big society, represent new and striking opportunities for all of us. And one of the most important aspects of these international partnerships is they open up completely new approaches to the fundraising for big science. And I think that's really, really going to be important. And in fact, I'll just emphasize there is in Washington today in biology an enormous big science, small science biology uh, fight where the small scientists have risen up and say, times are tight. We want to eliminate all big science and turn it all into small science. And that would be the worst thing we could do. We need a mixed portfolio. And the two operate enormously synergistic one to another. But I will say there are a lot of different types of big science. There's discovery big science, like the Human Genome Project. There's the big science I've talked about throughout this lecture, focused, vision-driven, milestone-driven, cross-disciplinary, systems-based, and integrative. That, I think, is the, the type of big science we want to drive toward. There are program projects, and there are large laboratories, uh, the national laboratories being an extreme example of, of these things. But what I'll close with is where I started. I think the grand challenge for all scientific and engineering disciplines in the 21st century is complexity. And I'll argue for the reasons we've talked about in this lecture, biology has very powerful approaches to, its, to deciphering its complexity. And that gives us an enormously powerful advantage if we think about what the fundamental problems of society are, healthcare and global health and animal health, nutrition, wellness, environment, energy, agriculture. In every case, we can take exactly the big science approach I've outlined for healthcare here and apply it to those other kinds of disciplines. And the really interesting question is, again, for institutions such as yourself, can you create an environment that has the right cross-disciplinary systems-driven environment to be a real player in the opportunities that these major challenges in society uh, actually represent? And I'll just say many people were involved in these projects. And I thank you for your time and for your patience. <clears throat>